So we had started on air pollution some time ago. Okay, so we did this, we looked at what is air pollution, what is clean air, what year, different life cycles, assessment, et cetera, et cetera. We did all of that. Then we went into looking at different scales, what are the concerns, ambient, indoor, dispersion, mixing, all of that stuff. Then we said the learning objectives, and we said there were two learning objectives for the first module. Then these are the standards available. And then we gave, I didn't say this last time, but one of the assignments I usually give is just have them put all the standards, whether it's CPCB, US EPA, Europe, World Health Organization, California has its own standards, put all of them. So the exercise is that they need to be able to put it on an A4 side sheet. Okay, so there'll be the pollutants and there'll be different columns. Each one of them would be a different norm based followed by a different country or a different organization. So just doing that one exercise completes that whole matter of standards. Okay, and I'm saying this again, I'm sharing some of the experiments that we've been doing which have worked. So I'm just sharing these. If you like the idea, use it. If you don't like it, use something else. Okay, all right. So then we did this exercise in class where we said, you know, how much sulfur dioxide. So that gives them a direct one-on-one, -on -one, I think half a sheet of paper had also given to you last time, for let people estimate that what should be the size of the room for me to be able to burn two milligrams of sulfur such that you know, I'm still in a safe, uh, space, space, safe, air, um, safe air quality levels. Okay, so we did all of that. We did the chemistry was straightforward. What's the volume? Of course, can't forget the double dhamakas, right? And we said, you know, and you should actually give a chocolate. I mean, people who did well, you should give them a chocolate. All right, now here's the difficulty. I told you last time also that there was a difficulty. Difficulty is that the data varies all the way from estimate of about 10 to about, I don't know how many zeros over here, but I think about eight orders of magnitude. Okay, so just now to de deal with the statistics, just add them all up and divide them by the number of students, you're gonna get pretty much the average somewhere here. So whoever is higher will actually win. Cheating. Okay, now this is not just a fun exercise in class, it's actually, that's what the real situation is in life. When you get a lot of data coming from many sources to be able to put them together, but this is just an introduction to the students to say, look, data that you and I are normally used to in terms of a physics experiment are not what's going to happen when you're dealing with environment. So, you know, we did that, we did this. Then, you know, somebody had asked, are we at some point in time going to cover global warming? So I never, in my class, I don't deal with global warming. All I do is ask them to see movies, okay? So they see this movie, and I give them two or three days. Oh, by the way, again, not see, study the movie, all right? So they do that, and then they come back. After some two, three days, I'll give them the next part, which I'll come to a little later. So the learning objective of the estimate, polluting, et cetera, et cetera, that's handled. And then we say, okay, we're gonna look at, able to dis the influence of meteorology, on the physics and the or dispersion of pollutants in the atmosphere. So we deal with that part. Uh, how do sources affect ambient air quality? That's the question, okay? And we said, you know, different kinds of sources. You have a point source, you have a line source, you have area line source, et cetera. They're quantified based on emission factor, which is, so for a car moving every kilometer, how much carbon monoxide is produced. So if I know the number of cars, I know the number of kilometers traveled, I know the number of, amount of carbon monoxide in that area. Okay, similarly, you know, you for other activities. And then once it has left the source, once it has left the source, we're pretty much going to depend on dispersion of that, and then we use modeling to be able to estimate how bad it really is or what are the main culprits, okay? So again, we did this last time. So we dealt with this, we said, you know, this, this very hot spot over here, this hot spot over here, this good strong red, which you cannot go do your pranayama on, by the time it comes down over here and it gets mixed with a larger volume, it becomes pink, so it is diluted, and by the time it reaches ground level, you would actually be able to breathe it without any health effects. Okay, wind rose, we also said, we introduced, I introduced to a special breed of people called meteorologists, and said, okay, this is the most romantic rose that they could come up with. At the same time, I totally appreciate the kind of richness of this graphic, which takes into account the wind speed, wind direction, as well as the frequency or the percentage of time that in a year or in a month or in, it varies, okay? It can be on a daily basis, it could be on an annual basis. If you take an annual basis, it doesn't change very much from year to year, but at the same time, it doesn't have the resolution of a day, which you can use, which you can do by using uh, model, you know, uh, data for at a, at a daily resolution also. Okay, vertical mixing, we said the false ceiling. In this room over here, there's pakka here, 
pakka here, pakka here, pakka here. But in the atmosphere, where the ceiling is, how high is the ceiling, is there a ceiling, that's going to decide how much volume is available for me for the mixing to take place and therefore the dilution of a particular pollutant. Okay? So we dealt with that in terms of the overall lapse rate and we said there is the adiabatic lapse rate and there's the environmental lapse rate. Based on that, we did some fun stuff in the class. You're welcome to do it. I will animate it a little more. Didn't have the time here, so I'll animate it a little more so that it's clearer when we, we do the final presentation in June. Okay, so we did all of that, a little bit of fun over here, et cetera, et cetera. We've gone through all of this. We did a class exercise. We did this. And then we just review, okay, these are the things that we've done. So we also said, as you were leaving last time, I know, we said, why are we doing all of this? We're doing it because if you need to set up a new industry, it implies adding a new source of pollutants. This source is permitted, by the way. Okay, it's not a bad thing. They're actually permitted by law. They're permitted. So if this source is permitted to emit after it has applied the best available control technology on their processes, after leaving the chimney, the concentrations on ground is determined by the meteorology. We don't have much of a say in the matter. You and I are pretty much left to the hands of meteorology. Okay, so if you wanted to know where to put a new, the new industry, if you wanted to know the pollution levels under the worst case scenario of stable conditions, especially during winter time, then what, under low, low wind conditions, what is the worst possible scenario? And you need to be, as designers, as people who are designing the air quality, you're designing the location, you need to be able to deal with not just what is being said, but a factor of sometimes five, sometimes 10, to be able to make sure that you, know, you are on the, in the safe limit. Okay, so uh, if you wanna know what height does the chimney need to be, you need to do this, you need to have this understanding. So students would be interested, why are we doing all of this? Ultimately, I said at one point in time, you are, you are, you are the collector of your town. So you better know this, you know, a chimney, how high should the chimney go? Okay, so I think we need to, oh, you really wanna do this, okay? The skit that happened yesterday and day before yesterday is complete now, like the cricket match. All right, there's a certain lifetime to it. You want to just honor for the lifetime it has. It has its impact, and then you need to, need to let go. So no, I request you to take that back. He's not that. Who he is for me is a partner in the fulfillment of this course right now. Okay, good, all right, good. <laughs> all right, so, what if, why, so Gaussian plume model is therefore used to estimate the ground level concentration of pollutants coming from a, from a chimney. Okay, inputs to GPM. Height. GPM is the Gaussian plume model. Height of the chimney, wind rose data, atmospheric stability of the region. These are not so easy to get, they're difficult to get, but once you get them, that's what becomes the input. We talked about Mumbai a little bit. What is the predominant wind direction? That's the predominant wind direction. That's where the refineries are, that's where rasta chemicals and fertilizer, et cetera, et cetera. So most of the time, people in Mumbai, the population of Mumbai is not getting affected by the pollutants because most of them are taken away. Never mind what happens to people in Navi Mumbai. Okay, however, and by the way, when these plants were set up, Navi Mumbai was non-existent almost. It wasn't there, okay? So it's unfair to say now that, you know, hey, you guys, are but the fact of the matter is that if Navi Mumbai is experiencing some pollution problems, it's really coming from the Mumbai side, okay? However, the concentrations, et cetera, over here are diluted enough that it doesn't affect too much. At the same time, people are reconsidering the heights of the chimneys. They're actually reconsidering the best available control technology 30 years ago versus now, so that if they were emitting at a level of 100, can they emit at a level of 10 now? Okay, that's a responsible thing to do, and people are actually engaged in these conversations. All right, so then one of the exercises I gave around this is, uh, find the wind rows for Mumbai or your home city. You may be able to find it, you may not be able to find it, that's fine, but just to go on Google and say, wind rows, and type your city name, it may not show up. Okay, but you will get some wind roses. You may want to find for the closest city that's available. So some, some interest, some curiosity can be you know, um, uh, brought about for the students. Another one is, does your city, does it have a meteorological station? Let them find out. Let them actually get into a relationship with what does the IMD do? It's important. See, I think one of the important things we need to do for our students is to connect them with different groups of people, different government organizations that are already in place to take care of certain things. Okay, so that's a part of the exercise. You gotta start, get them start thinking. You just gotta get them started. You can't give them, get them out of the, no, get them out of the textbook. The textbook they can put under the pillow and by osmosis they will get it, okay? <laughs> but they're not gonna be able to get what's not in the book which only you and I can provide. So this is what we did last time, right? Okay, so can you give a big clap for the last time's work? <laughs> All right, two or four, we got four modules, okay? So this is the second of the two modules. Okay, 
So this is part A of the homework that was given to them to study the movie, An Inconvenient Truth, right? OK, so this is now part B. Please study the film, this one. And then what I do is I give them a day and date, but that is three days after part A is complete. OK, there's a certain gestation period here. They actually have to, they, they, you know, the, the way they go is three days. Wow, I know now what global warming is. You know, Al Gore, the vice president of US, has actually been able to tell me this, et cetera, et cetera. They're in that little world of theirs, and you give them three days, and you know, they see this other movie, and it pulls the rug under their feet. Suddenly, the ground that they were standing on disappears, and they have no idea what's going on anymore. And then they come and ask, sir, what is the right answer? I said, I don't know. That's why I asked you to study the two films. So I'm not committed to giving them the right answer, because I don't know if there is any. OK? It also gets them out into, see, one of the things I've been telling people, by the way, when this assignment is submitted, I don't know if I said this to you already before, but even if I have, sometimes people copy, OK? Sometimes people copy. So when people copy and come, I usually tell them, look, if this question actually came up in a group discussion during an interview, are you ready for it? No, I'm not. Good, then go redo it. Because this is the only time you'll get to actually give thought to it and engage in this question. No time else, if you're a mechanical engineer or if you're a civil engineer, there may not be another opportunity for you to engage in this question. So it's time to do it now. You need another day or two days. Uh, no, sir, I'll give it to you by lunchtime. I said, you cannot do it by lunchtime. So give it to me in two days, and then they make that promise and do it. Right? So the idea always is to actually have them engage, not necessarily getting the right answer, but for them to start thinking and actually expand as a human being because they've just been obedient students till now. Hello? Obedient students till now, right? You, do, you want to have them expand into their adulthood. You want to have them expand them into questions that they were dealing with, which till now only their parents were dealing with. All right, and then I announce three days after part B is done, I make the announcement of the assignment. And the assignment is this. I actually give these details. And I'll just share that with you now. OK, so basically, I give them a critique. What they have to do is write a minimum 1,000 word critique on what is their stand in the domain of global warming. OK, so they have to study the two films and then come up with a critique. All right, OK. Uh, next part. So what did we do till now? The meteorology, dispersion, those kinds of things, right? Now, we've also touched upon global warming. Right? They would have studied it on their own. They'll have more questions now than we have answers for. And that's fine. We leave it at that. This part now, you'll be able to qualify air pollutants. So we just say pollution, pollution, but we need to know what they are. What, what are those pollutants? And we say there are two kinds of pollutants in the air. One is gaseous, and the other is particulate. OK? So there are different ways of measuring it. So for example, are you looking at, so when we did that exercise on sulfur dioxide, we looked at concentration. And we said micrograms per meter cube. A lot of times it is ppm, which is volume by volume. Many ways of dealing with it. And you know, they could also be, when it comes to particulate matter, it could be number of particles rather than mass of particles. Oh, by the way, this one is one of my favorite. How many of you have seen that advertisement uh, of uh, Fair and Lovely, in which they have a strip of different skin colors? right? And then what you're supposed to do is take that thing and match it against your face. And then for two weeks, go ba 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 You do that for two weeks. And then two weeks later, you come and look to see, aha, I've shifted two. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that seems to be like a new thing and all. No, no, no. People in air quality have been using it for the longest time. They used to have a gray scale. So they would take this gray scale and put it against the sky, against the smoke coming out. And based on which level of gray, they'd be able to say how polluted it was. It's been, a, it's been you know, very, fairly well used, well documented. All right, uh, again, from the perspective of exposure, you need to deal with hours to days. So for example, for three hour exposure, for sulfur dioxide, there's one standard. For eight hours, it's a different standard. For 24 hours, it's a different standard. Okay, so the amount of time for which you'll get exposed is a part of the standard. These are the criteria pollutants. What is criteria pollutants? Criteria pollutants are pollutants that are used to indicate the health of air. So if I go to the hospital and the doctor looks at my blood, my uh, heart, heart rate, right, my body temperature, that usually is a good indication of what's going on, mostly. Okay? However, at my age now, you know, they're beginning to actually look at blood pressure and other things also. Sometimes they even t send me for routine blood tests, et cetera, et cetera. But otherwise, if you just look at normal human health, if you're 
you know, if your head is cool and your, you know, pulse rate is okay, typically, you know, you're, you're doing fine. So in some sense, if you didn't want like a very detailed chemistry of what was going on, there are just few criteria pollutants. These are the pollutants that are used as criteria to estimate the health of air, okay? And all of these in some way or form are associated, associated with human activity. Okay, all of them are associated with human activity. And we get into some of the details. Ozone, by the way, these are primary, and this is secondary. Secondary means it is not directly emitted from somewhere. Oxides of sulfur are coming from any, any combustion source which, has, which is using fuel which has sulfur in it. Oxides of nitrogen, anytime you're using air, as anytime you're using air, oxygen is being used, but nitrogen is also, you know, high temperatures will get oxidized, etc. Um, PM10 is what we're going to talk about. Particulate lead, lead used to be used in, once upon a time in petrol, for what, anti-knocking? Tetraethyl lead, yeah, so tetraethyl lead, so what happened suddenly, they're not using lead anymore? How come the engines have started behaving themselves and they don't knock anymore? Okay, so they've changed the fuel, they've changed the composition of the fuel, and there are issues around that, but right now it's not being regulated. However, the particulate pollutant that was coming in the form of lead is now, you know, reduced. Uh, that's it. So that's, uh, that's all I'm going to say. And this is, again, coming from day-to-day -day human activities, okay, whereas industrial emissions are different. What is coming from a chimney, this is not what I'm talking about right now, okay? When you're talking about standards, we're talking about ambient air quality standards, which are for these. Industrial stand emission standards are there, but then it's just specific to a particular industry, specific to a particular size of the industry, and all that kind of stuff, all right? So we need not get into that right now. Okay, so we'll focus on PM10, which is particulate matter less than 10 micrometers in size. Particulate matter, which is less than 10 micrometers in size. Okay, and it actually has the units of concentration, which is mass per unit volume, micrograms per meter cube. Let's talk about that, okay. So how would you measure particulate pollutants? You basically take a polluted space over here, take a tube, put a filter over here, which has been pre-weighed. You have a flow meter, so you know you're taking a 10 liter per minute or 20 liter per minute. You have a vacuum pump. And then what you do is you do some measurements. So the filter paper that was weighed before and the filter paper that was weighed after. So you basically have now the amount of particulate matter that got collected on that filter paper. In how much time? Well, Q was the flow rate. You had a stopwatch also, so you found the time for which that flow rate was maintained, so it is. So delta M by QT is the concentration of particulate matter in this space, yes? Straightforward, not complicated at all, right? Okay, now particulate matter, if you were to do that, if you were to do this in a desert village in say Rajasthan somewhere, okay? Versus if you did it in a busy urban junction, let's say outside main gate at IIT, okay, would they be Similar? No, no, in fact, there's a likelihood that the particulate matter in the desert is much higher, right? So how do we deal with this? Because all we did over here was take the total amount of particulate matter. We didn't make any distinctions between size or anything else, okay? So we need to now qualify this because you can't call, you can't use this standard to go to um, Rajasthan and say, hey, you guys are very polluted. That's, that's, that won't apply, okay? So the appreciation of size begins to now come in, and uh, not all particles are created equal. Human beings are, human beings are, not all particles, okay? Particles are not created equal, and let's talk a little bit about that. So this is when I do a little bit of board work in the class, okay? The board work I do in the class, and I say, how many of you know what is the size of an ant? Size of an ant, ant, mungi, mungi, chinti, chinti, everybody know chinti? Yeah, okay, so I actually go on the board and make a dot, and I ask somebody at the back of the seat, you can see this, this is, yeah, I said, then it's not an ant. <laughs> because you can't see an ant from that far, right? Okay, so ant has a certain size, and people don't go around measuring ants, do you? I don't think even as a kid I did that, take a scale and say, let me measure what this ant size is. I don't do that, but typically, what is the size of an ant? Somebody, please. One mm. One mm? Okay. okay, all right, one mm, two mm, somewhere there, yeah? Not the big black ones, and the small red ones. The small ones, the ones that bite, really bite. Black ones are going like majestically, they're much bigger. I'm not talking about those, okay? Everybody, in the world of ants now? Ants, you love ants? 
Love ants, or which hand? Right hand. You love ants. Okay, very good. Now, ants are gas molecules in the air. Ants are gas molecules in the air. Let's just say. Let's just say ants are gas molecules in the air. So, oh, what is that? An ant? Did you see an ant? Did you see an, did you see an ant? Really, really? You saw an ant? Oh, you have pretty good eyes, yeah? You can actually see ants over there. Oh, there's another ant. There, there. Oh, there's another one. Yeah, right there. Any more? Oh, what is that? Group of ants. <laughs> Excellent. Well said, well said. Because it's actually an elephant. It's actually an elephant, but you can't see all of it on the scale. You know, I can't put an ant and an elephant on the same scale on this. Sorry, I need a much bigger screen. I can't do it. So, sorry, that's all. And this is the best I could draw. What a lovely elephant, isn't it? Yeah, never mind the ants. Ants look like stars over here. But you know, you get the point, right? So the point is that I actually am dealing with elephants that are suspended in an ocean of ants when I'm looking at particulate matter. When I'm looking at particulate pollutants. And in the class, what I do is I take a duster, two dusters I take, and I say, OK, everybody ready? I put seat against the light, and I do put, 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 and they see all this dust going around. OK, that is all elephants. Ants you can't see, yeah? Can you see the ants right now? You can't. But ants are the ones which are causing the sky to be blue. The molecules in the air are scattering light. So therefore, you see the blue sky. So you, because it's you know, 10 kilometers, etc. so you can actually see it. But everybody with me? OK, good. All right, so we got elephants suspended in ants. Our perception, our understanding has to come from that place. Otherwise, we'll not be able to appreciate what it takes to deal with particulate matter. Gases, we understand very well. Particulate matter, only in the last 30, 40 years, we've started to develop an understanding. OK, so OK, by the way, sometimes even dinosaurs. OK, so if I take, if I go to the ground outside, and I pick up some mud from here, and I throw it in the air, what will happen? Some of the? Particles will settle out. Some of the larger particles will settle out. Some of them will begin to float away, diffuse out. Okay? So those are, but they're still visible compared to the ants. They're still visible, right? So these are the elephants and dinosaurs. And dinosaurs went but quickly, right? But they're still in the air. They're still out there. But they don't stay in the air long enough. So therefore, it's not too much of a concern from a perspective of air pollution. If it goes into the air, it settles out very quickly. So you and I are not breathing it. But there are particles which remain. The elephants remain floating. The ants keep them up. Baby elephants. Baby elephants. OK, let's say baby elephants. All right? OK. OK? So just to get scales, ant, 2 millimeters, spherical baby. Baby, you already knew it, huh? <laughs> All right. So spherical baby elephant is about 2. Spherical, huh? Spherical, huh? Watch what spherical. OK, so two. So this is a, three orders of magnitude, right? Similarly, nitrogen molecule and respirable particle is also three orders of magnitude. Convinced, or should I keep talking about this? I mean, I'll keep talking, but about this. OK, good. Let's move on. All the well-established physics of ants, ideal gases, everybody know ideal gases? OK, all the principles, all the physics of ants is not applicable to the elephants. OK, all the magic of nano, heard of nano, nano, nano? Yeah, nano everywhere. All the magic of nano is in this new world of elephants. Ability to understand this range of sizes has become possible due to development of instrumentation in the last 30, 40 years. Therefore, before that, even the handbooks ended at 2 micrometers. Below 2 micrometers, the particles didn't exist. They almost considered it gaseous. And you know, the places where it's making a difference is you know, aerosol science and engineering, powder production, nanoproducts, atmosphere, medical sciences. Medical sciences. People seen? We'll come to that Okay, later. OK, this is a slide. It's, uh, I want to acknowledge, I got it from this company, Osmonix. I think it's a beautiful slide. It covers a lot of details uh, in a way in which students can appreciate it. Okay? This is what is visible to the naked eye. This is an optical microscope and then scanning microscope, et cetera. So different you know, levels of uh, resolution that you can get. Uh, this over here is uh, 10 micrometers. 10 micrometers. This is 100 micrometers. Okay? This is the visible band of light. Visible band of light. Okay? And that's about human hair. Human hair is about 100 micrometers. So which means if I put 10 hair one next to another, they'll fill one millimeter space on a scale. 10, 10 hair put together next to each other will make one millimeter. 
100 micrometers is naked, visible to the naked eye. You can see 100 micrometers, you can see hair. You can see people's hair, right? Okay, good. Red blood cells, about eight to 10. That's the range. You don't see them with naked eye. You can only see them with a microscope. Very good. Paint pigment. Why I talk about paint pigment is because there is also an interest in these particular matter from the perspective of quality of powders. So paint pigment, for example, if you went and picked up a white paint from a company and you picked up a super white paint from the company, the only difference is that the super white actually has paid attention to the size of the particles and selected the size in such a way that it scatters maximum amount of light and therefore you require lesser of it. So it is five times more expensive because it is 10 times more effective. Okay, so some people, you know, students might be, might suddenly get interested from the physics perspective or materials perspective, and the physics is the same. It's not, not very different at all, okay? All right, now, this is where we begin to deal with the health effects. 10 micrometer, anything which is greater than 10 micrometers will get stopped in your nose. The design of a human, normal human adult nose is such that 10 micrometers and above will get stopped in the nose. Above 10 micrometers will get stopped in the Nose, human nose, human nose. I then give an exercise on what would be respirable for an elephant. That should be fun, right? I haven't got an answer to that one yet. But anyway, we still got three, two months to go. We will find an answer to that one, okay? All right. Anything less than 10 micrometers is respirable. So therefore, the definition of PM10, PM10 means respirable particulate matter by human beings, adults, not children. Okay, 10 micrometer for human beings, okay. Oh, this is when I actually bring in a little bit of fun. You should see whether it's, it's culture sensitive, <laughs> culturally sensitive, so you just wanna be careful about whether you wanna use it or you don't wanna use it. I actually use this to say, hey, tobacco smoke, tobacco, tobacco smoke, hey, tobacco smoke, hey, tobacco. It's all respirable. Thank God, otherwise you'd have wasted your money, <laughs> okay. All right, and then the next part of it is that this same, the same physics is applicable to delivery of medication through the respiratory route. The same principles. By the way, you know you are delivering a drug using a cigarette, right? Now, if that was done for medical purposes, it's a good thing. How many of you seen, sometimes, you know, you have colleagues or students who are dealing with asthma, they carry a little dispenser with them, and they go like that, right? A large part of the problem of design of that is that the droplet size of the medication is not the right size for it to get all the way to your lungs. It actually, you know, 90%, 80% of it gets just stuck over here, okay? So the physics is the same. So if somebody's interested in developing, you know, going into the research around how to deliver medication through the, physics is the same. I rest my case? Move on? Okay, good. So, you know, those are some of the relative sizes. Very important figure, extremely, extremely, extremely important figure. In fact, the entire air quality for pollutants, particulate pollutants can be oriented around this one graph, okay? And what it is, is this. It's got three plots on it, and it's got three axes on it, okay? So the first plot, first thing is that this is the size of the particle, the diameter of the particle. When we say diameter, we usually mean aerodynamic diameter. Because the physical diameter, it's very difficult. If you take a particle from the atmosphere and put it under the microscope, it's not spherical. The moment you say diameter, it assumes already in the saying of it that it is spherical. Okay, so we only talking about aerodynamic diameter, which is, we can get into the details of that later. So this is the aerodynamic diameter. This over here, this axis is some representation of the frequency or the number mass size distribution function. Okay, so, and this one here, I'll talk about a little later. So there are three plots here. One, the black one here. Can you see this one? The black one here, this one, right? This one. This is the mass size distribution. So based on mass, this is the distribution you would get. And there are three modes in it. The first mode is the nuclei mode. The second mode is the accumulation mode. And third is the coarse mode. Coarse mode, by the way, all of these are respirable. Huh? All of these are respirable. 
right? Okay. So this one over here, this is the coarse mode. It usually will come from dust. It'll come from a desert, or it'll come from just entrainment of dust, which is coming from the ground, some agricultural land, or even road dust, which is sitting over there. So this is the coarse mode, which is the large particles. By and large, benign, because they're large, they're coming from geological sources, so they don't have much of a toxic effect. This part over here, this part, the nuclei mode, is the one which is emerging from chemical reactions. Okay, it's emerging from chemical reactions. Somebody mentioned over here, it's a collection of ants. Very well said, because at some point in time, uh, how many of you from, from a cold city, from a place like Dehradun, Darjeeling, Missouri, some place which gets cold, in Delhi also it gets cold. In winter time, we used to do as kids, now we used to pretend, remember? Huh? We used to do that, basically pretending we are smoking. Actually, we used to get smoke out of our mouth, right? So the, the air in the mouth is what? Fully saturated at 37 degrees Celsius. Outside temperature, 4 degrees, 5 degrees, the moment it comes out, the temperature drops, it gets saturated, and suddenly you see a visible droplet. In the mouth, if you look, other than Krishna, you see the entire Brahman, but otherwise, you know, I, you don't see anything other than my bad teeth, right? You don't see any vapor, you don't see the ants in there. You don't see the ants. The water vapor is in the form of ants in the mouth, you don't see it, okay? But the moment it comes out, the temperature drops, the saturation is exceeded, and these water molecules actually become droplets, okay? That is a collection then of that elephant that is formed is truly a collection of those ants. Who had said that? Somebody said, yeah. So that's okay. So it's basically a collection of ants, but it is the birth of an elephant. It wasn't there before. It wasn't there before. It came to be because of the saturation conditions. Earlier than that, in its previous avatar, it was just an ant. Okay? We can get into the physics of it and all that stuff. We won't get into that right now. But then, you know, when you look at, say, uh, uh, let's say, uh, candle burning, candle burning, on top of it, there's this black particles that are coming. Now, those black particles are not in the wax, right? They're not in the wax. The wax gets melted, goes up the capillary, begins to get oxidized, and it's not full combustion. If it was full combustion, then there wouldn't be the romantic light around it. By the way, by the end of this lecture, usually people don't look at candles that romantically at all. You know, all they see is, oh, where is the aerosol? Where is... <laughs> I'm so bad, I'm telling you. <laughs> so, so, you know, you, we used to do this as kids, right? We used to take a piece of uh, paper and put it just above the candle so we would get a black spot, right? Where is that coming from? Those are elephants, by the way. But they're not coming from that same path where you do that and that actually... No, it is actually coming through chemical reaction. So there are two pathways to these small particles. One, it could be nucleation, which is the first one, and second one is chemical reaction, right? Okay, good. So this mode is coming from nucleation, con the, the, uh, nucleation which means um, you know, chemical reactions or formation or birth of particles coming from vapor phase. This is coming from dust, right? And then you have somewhere in the middle the accumulation mode, and that accumulation mode is actually a result of the particles are not big enough that they will deposit out. The particles are not big enough that they will deposit out by sedimentation. They're not small enough that they will diffuse out like gases. So the removal efficiency of these particles from the atmosphere is lowest. So if I take this slide and I invert it, just flip it over horizontally, you get the accumulation mode. So notice, okay, if I take this and I flip it vertically, it actually will become this mode. Okay, about the same size, somewhere near one micrometer. So these particles are not big enough to deposit out, neither small enough to diffuse out, So, and you and I are exposed maximally to this, because it remains in the air for the longest time. Okay, all right. So talk to each other about the three modes. Go ahead, talk to each other about the three modes. Please go ahead. Okay. All right, very good. Now, this was mass concentration, okay? Mass concentration. Now, when I look at the number concentration, number concentration is not the same as mass concentration. This blue plot over here, this blue plot over here represents the number. So particles that are getting generated by chemical reactions or by nucleation are huge in numbers, but they don't contribute much to mass. Why they don't contribute much to mass is because 
one, one micrometer particle is equal to how many 0.1 micrometer particles? One, one micrometer particle in mass is equal to how many 0.1 micrometer particles? Thousand. Thousand, because dp cube, pi by six dp cube. So the cubic relationship is there. Therefore, while the numbers are huge, one particle over here somewhere will contribute to about 1,000 times the particles over there. OK, so that little game continues, all right? All right, so th that's basically the other mode, the other plot. Third plot, which is an important plot, is this plot. OK, this plot over here. And again, it is saying that not everything that is respired, not everything that you breathe actually stays in the lungs. Most of it is exhaled out. Okay, so then what are the particles? What sizes should I be worried about? Okay, let's take a look what sizes we should be worried about. If you look at this over here, this size, which is less than 0.1, less than 0.1, less than 0.1, there's a good 70 to 80 percent chance that it will deposit in the alveolus. Everybody know what alveolus is? Alveolus is that last little balloon in your lung. And that's the only place, I remember from my class 10th biology, that's the only place where the color of the blood in the veins and arteries is different. You remember? Okay, the artery over there is carrying the blue blood. The vein is carrying the red blood because it got oxygenated in the lung, correct? Each of these alveolus have a rich capillaries around it which are doing the, the exchange is happening here. If that got covered with particulate matter, I have lesser surface available, plus it can actually do toxic stuff. It can actually damage those linings, okay? So our concern, therefore, is particles which are less than 0.1 micrometer have a good chance that they, there are other parts of the respiratory tract where other things will deposit, okay? But in the alveoli, you can expect most of the particles, 70 to 80 percent of the particles which are going into your alveolus will actually deposit, okay? Which is a little alarming now, which is a little alarming because we just said that most of the chemical reactions that lead to particles are in this mode. So anything which is smaller than this, this part is benign. Even if you breathe it in, not a problem. It's benign geological material. But this part over here is toxic stuff that has emerged from combustion, etc., reactions, etc., and therefore you have a concern. So we therefore now say, oh, okay, we're not just going to talk about total mass of particles, we're going to actually have a size distribution or have a size specific qualification for particulate pollutants. Fair enough? Okay, good. Okay, this one here. Like we said, you know how in a place like Dehradun you can pretend that happens. Same thing happens in coal combustion. In coal combustion, the coal itself will have several heavy metals. When it goes through the hot flame zone, hot zone, these heavy metals evaporate. When it reaches the cooler zones, they actually begin to either nucleate out or react or condense on smaller particles, thereby enriching these small particles with heavy metals. Okay, so smaller particles, weight to weight, they have a lot more deposition, a lot more condensation of, uh, what, of uh, heavy, heavy metals vapor. Okay, we, we can get into details of this later, okay? Did some measurements in Mumbai. Always good to see, you know, it's okay to go to Google and find out all the stuff that's been going on in Pittsburgh and New York, but always good to always find out what's going on in India, you know, what's going on in Mumbai. So there were two measurements that were made in some parts of Mumbai. This is almost like now eight, nine years ago. And the, the size distributions are pretty similar. So in India, it's not very different from anywhere else in the world. Most urban places would have size distribution that look like this. In fact, PM 2.5, I'll talk about that a little bit. So this is PM 10. Everybody understand PM 10 now? So the area under this curve, area under this curve is PM 10, the total mass concentration less than 10 micrometer in size. However, we just said, now listen, not all particles are created equal. Some of these particles are toxic and coming from chemical reactions, and they usually tend to be less than one micrometer in size. So should I be looking at, within this PM 10, should I be looking at a further qualification? And that further qualification is called PM 2.5. PM 2.5 is what? PM 2.5 is particles that are less than 2.5 micrometers. PM 2.5 is always a subset of PM 10. PM 2.5 is always a subset of PM 10. Okay. Now, if I were to take a ratio of PM 2.5 to PM 10, everybody understand? 
that anthropogenic and combustion are same, which is reflecting in PM2.5. If I'm going to talk about the benign part, then the PM10, the, the, the accumulation mode or large part of the coarse mode would be contributing to PM10. So I'm really comparing between the contribution which is coming from combustion sources and anthropogenic in PM10. So PM2.5 is considered to be the anthropogenic component of PM10. Okay, so um, if the ratio is small, which means PM10 is much larger, PM2.5 is smaller, then I don't have to worry, I don't have a health concern. So in Rajasthan, in a village in Rajasthan, in a desert, PM10 will be high. But PM2.5, very low, because there are no any chemicals, there's no industry, maybe no chemical reactions going, unless you go into a chula and actually measure it. No, but if you were just look at the ambient, there's no combustion, so the bin is coming from dust. So PM2.5 is not there, so the ratio is small, so most of it therefore is benign. However, if PM2.5 is large, then I have a concern. Because then what I'm saying is that the large component of what I'm breathing is now going to be toxic and you know, it's going to deposit in my lungs. Fair enough? Okay, good. Now some results here from Mumbai. This is PM10, this is PM2.5. The ratio is the slope. Correct? The ratio is the slope. So this is the ratio given over here. In developed countries, it's as much as 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So we initially felt very happy that ours was lower. But the total amount that we have in the atmosphere in India is five to 10 times what they have. Okay, so this, this ratio doesn't make sense if we have, and I'll come to that a little bit later. So can you see this? This is two stations, the same stations, where you, so they, they looks like over here. This is in Pune. So we thought, you know, Mumbai could be different from Pune because Mumbai being a coastal city versus Pune being inland a little bit, it might be different, not really. Okay, quite similar. In fact, these are together. Mumbai and Pune all together. Okay, notice that there's a little box here. The CPCB norms require that always 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days in a year, you should be inside that box. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you India. That's where we are right now. And things haven't improved very much in the last seven, eight years. Uh, we were also expecting that around Diwali, we should have a lot more PM2.5. Wouldn't you expect it? A lot of smoke, a lot of, you know, patakas going around, people celebrating, etc. So this is Diwali time. Okay, that's Diwali time. And notice that this ratio is not, you know, it's, it's pretty much the same line. So what we said, what is going on? We were really expecting it to be much higher. It seems to be in track. Apparently people are traveling a lot also during that time. So the, the transport, the entrainment of dust, all of that resuspended dust is going on. But if I were to just isolate these points over here and take a ratio, it is higher than the rest of the annual average. Okay, so it also gives you that indication that there is smoke at that time. Okay, uh, so one more time, just to reinforce why we were doing all, all of this. We ultimately want to qualify the particulate pollutants. And the way we've qualified first is by size, and then further, we went one step further and said, look, there's a difference in the chemical composition even based on size. Size was based on respiration. And then after that, what is the part which is toxic versus what is the part which is benign that has us defined PM2.5 and PM10. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of this one. Talk to each other. Get this sorted out. I'm not taking any questions just now. We'll deal with it during lunchtime because there's a lot to cover. Okay, go ahead, please talk to each other about this. Talk at this time. You're supposed to talk at this time. Okay, all right, enough questions in the room, right? Okay, module three. All right, sizing of particles. It's okay to say, okay, the size and all that stuff, but how, how on earth do you actually size them? This is our normal perception of sizing. Yes, the first time, yeah, sieving. The first time, you know, my mother was trying to make something in the kitchen and uh, she needed maida. Everybody know maida? So I used to think as a kid that suji, rava, right? Suji, rava, atta, and maida, I used to think they come from three different grains. Don't look at me like I'm, the, you know, made a silly, you know, stupid mistake. I was silly, yeah? I was silly, I'm even silly now, okay? I keep having these assumptions around life, okay? So my mother, she took atta in a chunni, 
ಸೈಜ್ಮೀಟರ್ಸ್ಟಕ್ಕೋಸ್ಟ್ Okay, everybody ready? I'm going to do a very disgusting thing. Ready? I'm going to do a very interesting thing. No, disgusting thing. Interesting thing. So sometimes, you know, once in a while when nobody's looking, when nobody's looking, huh? Nobody looking, nobody looking, finger. It goes straight into your nose. Right? You do a little bit of tickling over there. Right? And something comes out. And then, of course, you don't look at it, right? because first it could be dark and second you don't want to be so obvious etc but you know you at some point in time now this disposal problem <laughs> you understand and you, i'm telling you you guys don't get your handkerchiefs out you want to bet on this okay so you you know you see you don't see that but next time i request you to see it <laughs> no, no i'm not kidding i'm serious see typically on a clean day when you have been in a clean environment it will have some kind of a marble green i've done the observations okay <laughs> marble green kind of a color you understand what i'm saying it it has a certain it has quite quite a pleasant color actually um, but on a day when you've gone out into the traffic and you come back that whole thing is black it's very dark color okay so you should just know that you know you should thank your nose every time because it's doing its job okay now anything which is less than 10 micrometer everybody okay with that disgusting thing Yeah now you really want to get that to your students as well it's not just for you i'm sharing this because i actually do this in the class and you know share this with the students so they actually get an appreciation of the work of the nose and you know what size actually is stopped and what actually gets through so uh, what about less than 10 micrometers less than 10 10 micrometer means you can't see with your naked eye now less than 10 micrometer you can't see so my mag- my mother cannot be a magic woman if i give her 10 micrometer particle size lesser and say okay now do the sieving where is it i have no idea by the way the sieving requires a certain sedimentation velocity if you take 10 micrometer particles and you put it in the air you'll have to wait a long time before it settles out you know this you can do some calculations you do a calculation of how long it takes for a 1 micrometer particle to actually settle out it's a few millimeters in an hour okay so you cannot depend on sieving so how are we going to measure particulate matter that's a class exercise now okay so the exercise we do is how would you size and count aerosol particles in the nanometer size range okay so we we'll just quickly go over it so there are different ways in which you do it there are inertial impactors where you use the inertia of an elephant where you use the inertia of an elephant which is suspended in an ocean of ants so it's very simple what you do is you got particles of all sizes here which are coming in and as they come in through the nozzle you actually put an obstacle in the way so these particles are coming all three different sizes they're coming the gas is coming and you put an obstacle in the way when you put the obstacle in the way the small size particle and the medium size particles they will go ahead and follow this path of the gas which is the ants so the ants are able to take the small particle and the medium size particles along with them but the elephant the large elephant was too huge for them to be able to kind of uh, uh, move out so that poor large elephant actually has to go put it goes impacts against that obstruction okay so what did you just do you took three different kinds of particles passed them through a nozzle provided an impaction plate in which the largest particle actually went and impacted because of inertia okay now the next part of the trick is you go ahead this is some volume coming in let's say 30 liters per minute okay so what you do now is you reduce this next nozzle size so if you reduce the next nozzle size the same 30 liters per minute has to go through but this time the velocity will become higher so that particular particle which could escape here will impact this one okay so on and on and on you 10 stages you can separate out all the particles suspended in the air in different class different size classes categories huh category yeah so first topmost so what you do over here is you put a filter paper or you put a metal foil and on that metal foil these part this has been pre-weighed 
you waited before, and then you run it for, say, one hour or something like that, and you bring it back to the lab, and you wait again. So the difference in the two will tell you that between this size and this size, this much mass was there. And the next one, this between this size and this size, this much mass there. Between this size and this size, so on for 10, so you actually get a histogram. So on the x-axis, you will have the diameter of the particle, and on the y-axis, you'll have the mass collected. So you have the entire size distribution. Yes? Yeah. OK, good. Next, this is what it looks like. It costs about 8, 9 lakh rupees, this instrument. It's called Moody Micro Orifice Uniform. By the way, why it's called Micro Orifice? Because these orifices in the first stages are visible. By the time you get to the last stages, even if you put it against the light, you can't see the hole in it. OK? The principle is not sieving. The principle is not sieving. The principle is impaction of a particle because of the inertia. OK, very good. We do some fun stuff. Oh, by the way, this is important. You should just know that the chemistry, so stage 0 is the largest particle. Stage 10 is the smallest particle. Stage 0 is the largest particle. Stage 10 is the smallest particle. Most of the larger particles have silica. Most of the smaller particles have carbon. Chemistry for different size particles is very, very different. That's why this component tends to be toxic. Okay, heavy metals tend to be in the smaller sizes. Okay, all right. Different sizes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh, by the way, we made one in our lab. So if students are interested in making one, let me know. We have a paper in which we actually take, give instructions as to how to get it made. This one costs six thousand rupees. Six thousand rupees in a local workshop. You can even do it in your workshop. Okay, and it compares pretty well with the eight lakh instrument. This is ours. This is the 8 lakh instrument. But just to be fair, OK, just to be fair, uh, 8 lakh instrument gives you 10 sizes, 10 different sizes, whereas ours, the one we use, only differentiated between PM10 and PM2.5, which is fine for us, right? Which we needed because we need to do some measurements. OK. All right, then optical particle counters. You know why you can see a cloud? Because it scatters light, right? If you take water, everybody know turbidity? OK, so you take one glass of water, which is turbid, and one glass of water, which is clear, and I give both of you for you to drink. Unless you see bubbles coming out and you think it is you know, limca or something like that, you'll probably have the clear one, right? Because you suspect that if it is turbid, there's some contamination over there, right? Same thing over here, except that we don't deal with it as a cloud. We deal with it as particle by particle. Single particle, single particle, single particle. OK, so each particle will scatter a certain amount of light, and that amount that gets scattered is equivalent to the size in some way. And each time it scatters, it's a beep. So you count it, and you look at the size of the scatter and say the size. Okay? So this is basically what it looks like. These are particles which are coming through a laser. So this is the detector over here. This is the detector here. So every time a particle passes by this laser, it actually scatters light. And then depending on the particle size, you'll have a certain intensity of the light scattered. So the size of the scatter will tell you the size of the particle. And every time a particle passes by, there'll be a beep, 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 beep. The number of beeps is basically the number of particles. OK, this instrument, about 8 lakhs, 10 lakhs, depending on which one you want to buy. Last one, electrical mobility. You charge the particles. How many of you still remember 1 upon 4 pi epsilon permissivity q, q divided by r squared? Come on. Long time ago, the force experienced by a particular particle which is charged in an electrical field. Remember? Same thing. So the principle is exactly the same. What you do is, because these particles are so small that they do not have sufficient mobility under gravity, or they do not have sufficient, you cannot produce the kind of inertia that is required in the previous impaction, etc. So what you do is you charge these, and you introduce them into an electric field, and then you sort them out based on that. Okay? We'll talk about details later. So you charge the particles, you size them. Particle counter. We'll get details later. I'll give you these details later. There are other instruments. High volume samplers is something which everybody's very familiar with. Doesn't cost too much, about one and a half lakhs now. Mini volume sampler, PM10, PM2.5. Again, based both. So this one is based on inertia, but in a cyclone. This one is based, based on impaction, which we just did, impactors, which he said. And then this last one over here is based on optical properties. So you actually, this is a particle counter, optical particle counter. This one is impaction. This one is cyclone. OK, so this is a homework at this point in time I give to the students. Familiar? You've seen, most of you have seen this cartoon before, right? 
So uh, the assignment is this. Evaluate the scientific feasibility of the proposed solution by the cartoonist. So then they have to go. They have to go figure out from Google, you know, what is the rate at which we breathe out carbon dioxide? What is the weight ratio? What is the amount of tree required? How much per surface area of the leaf will be oxygen giving to me? <laughs> and then, of course, the first question comes up, what will it do at night? Photosynthesis is only at night. Yeah, yeah, they've taken it. So this only can work during daytime. But at least for daytime, will it work? Or will I have to carry my own little truck of trees? Carbon dioxide will, where do, you and I will respire? No, sir. Huh. Uh, that, uh, 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 so our, uh, what we exhale, yeah, it's simple, it's very simplistic, yeah. right? But it's interesting that the students can actually get engaged in it, right? So I breathe out because of respiration, carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide is taken up by photosynthesis, gives me oxygen back. But I have to do the matchmaking now. Because the rate at which I'm throwing out carbon dioxide, I should be getting the oxygen at the rate at which I can live, right? Like that. Okay, so everybody got this? And the second part of the question is, what key steps would you need to take to develop an air quality management program for your home city? Ta-da! You are the collector of your city, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so this is when they begin to get engaged in how are they going to figure it out? What is needed? Some of it which you covered, some which we will cover in the, in the near future. But you set up the question accordingly, okay? Done? Okay, four of four. I think this is an important aspect that most students would have a concern about. How do you control these, right? Now, when we're talking about control, we're now talking about two levels, at a personal level and at the industrial level, right? Okay, uh, but let's just look at it scientifically. We won't bring in the distinction over here. Let's just take a look at what is it that, by the way, this is much of chemical engineering. Chemical engineers here? Chemical engineers? One, that's it. So then, oh, a few. So you guys are my friends, OK? So if I say something wrong, don't raise your hand. <laughs> now I can just about say anything, right? OK. I'm a chemical engineer, too, so. OK, so this is just a brief summary of the principles that are used for control of pollutants which are in the gas stream. If it is large particles, then we can use settling chambers. And I'll get into the details of this. This is the principle. This is the equipment, and this is the principle. This is for particulate matter, and this is for gases. OK, we'll go over it now. So particulate matter, there are many ways of dealing with it. You can use mechanical means, or you can use electrical means. Mechanical means anything which is larger than 20 micrometers, you can use a gravitational settling. You just allow the dust to settle. Gravity, you don't have to do too much. You just have to allow it enough space, enough time for it to settle out. Okay. Cyclones, you provide some inertia. You pay for it in the pumping cost. You actually have to, I'll go over it, okay? So this is typically what a gravitational settler would look like. In a cement industry, this stuff over here is actually their product. So they have an interest in recovering their product, okay? So this is dollars over here, sitting over here. So depending on the size, they can separate it out. Or there could be another way of dealing with it, that you do not allow this huge space this huge space, you provide plates which are closely spaced. So that's what you do. So you introduce the dirty gas from here, and these are plates. So they just have to move this much distance for it to settle out on a plate. Okay, they just have to move small distance for it to settle out on a plate, and then you shake it up and you know clean it up. Okay, this is a cyclone. Okay, what you do in a cyclone is you introduce the gas stream tangentially. So you take a cylinder. Okay, and you introduce it tangentially. So when it gets introduced tangentially, now it's going to go whoo, whoo, whoo. It's going to go right in a spiral direction. And when it is going in that spiral direction, the particulate matter, which have higher inertia, will get thrown against the wall. Okay, so that's what you use. You use again the particle inertia, but in a circular motion. Okay, all right. So then basically the gas, the, the this is typical dimensions. By the way, look at the efficiency. Particle size is given. Different efficiency. So larger particles. Definitely very efficient, but anything smaller than 20 micrometers, cyclones are not very good. Okay, you can use them up to. By the way, it's a good step though. Before you use any other kind of high-end filters, expensive filters, it's a good idea to use cyclones or gravitational settlers to be able to remove the large bulk of the mass. Again, these larger particles contribute much to the mass. Smaller particles don't contribute much to the mass, so you can remove the bulk of the mass, but the finer, fine polishing can be done using other instruments like other equipment like back filters and uh, electrostatic precipitators. Okay, so this is, this is the size. It could look like this size. They're pretty huge. 
Okay, they're pretty huge. Mechanic, ah, mechanical filtration. Okay, <laughs> this is where my handkerchief comes into play. I'll come to that. I think maybe I should show some pictures. You familiar? Right? Seen these? You've seen these, right? In some way or form, you've seen this. If you haven't, you've used your handkerchief lifts a lot of times, right? To say, hey, it's too dusty. A lot of times, you don't do it because it's dusty. You do it because it's smelling bad. Usually, you know? Yeah, okay. Uh, and hopefully, your, your handkerchief, would, you would have put a little bit of perfume in the morning or something like that, so you neutralize that bad odor or something like that. But, you know, but this is more for, oh, this is another one. Very typical. This is a, some kind of a metal clip that you put on the nose and you just tighten it over there. This is my favorite. It actually has a little uh, glue strip over here, so you just have to remove it and then stick it on your forehead. It's pretty good. It's good, and it also says, just peel and seal. Nice jingle to it. Nice peel and seal, nirma, washing powder to nirma, like that, right? So peel and seal, and it's one child mask, and it tells you, easy to apply, multi-purpose, pocket size, no straps, it protects eyes, it allows you to be clearly, clearly see. Eyeglasses compatible, ha ha ha, anti fog sheet, all that stuff, fancy stuff. Okay, all from Google, by the way. Uh, oh, I don't know what this guy is doing. He seems to be standing in, an, in a stadium, an indoor stadium. Why would he be wearing a mask inside an indoor stadium? I don't know. So I, that, I found it a little funny as to why he was using that. But these masks over here, okay, these masks are used in industry. They're used in industry to protect the workers. Okay, so for example, if somebody's working in an ammonia-based fertilizer plant, then people are going to get exposed, especially if there's a leak or something's going on, then they need to actually go and, uh, you know, take care of it, but they have to protect themselves. So these cartridges then are not just fabric. They actually have some kind of a chemical in it, some kind of a gel in it, which will tend to neutralize that particular gas which is expected. So for sulfur dioxide, it would be a different cartridge. For ammonia, it would be a different cartridge. Okay? All right. You've seen these filters? Intake into the car, right? And these are serrated like this. Large surface area is required, otherwise the delta P would be very high. Oh, by the way, uh, this recently, there's somebody who approached me with a new product. It's like earplugs. You know earplugs, the soft earplugs, right? This guy actually had nose plugs. Which I thought was pretty fancy. The only thing is I refused to try it because I said it'll make me feel like I have a cold, so I'll start breathing from my mouth. Okay? And we, I've been trying to give this project as a student project for the longest time, as an MTech project for the longest time, but nobody seems to want to take it. I wanted to design a crash helmet, which is used for motorcyclists, people on two-wheelers, to actually have a filtration device because I think people on two-wheelers are most exposed. People in a car, they don't get exposed to the traffic you know, pollution, but people on two wheelers get exposed. Uh, but the problem comes in that the moment you put a filter over there, they actually have to provide, the lung has to do extra work to suck through the filter paper. You understand, right? Everybody, at some point in time, you've had a cold drink with a straw? Okay, now next time you go to have a cold drink, just put a knot in the straw, and then try and Okay, so the same thing would happen here. If I put a nose plug over here, I'll have to breathe through that. It's a lot of work on the lungs. So I'm not too sure, but we do, we are still looking for some effect. These are not very effective. The moment there's a little bit of a leak around the face over here, the air will find the easiest path. Na? Why will it go from, you know, a more difficult path? So there's you know, still a little bit of work to be done around that. So therefore, the surface area needs to be higher. If the surface area is higher, then the pressure drop is lesser. Okay, that's the reason for it. These are different industry scale. They actually have bags. It's like a, like socks. But instead of having a bend like that, it is straight. So you actually can introduce the air either from the inside or from the outside. And then from time to time, you have to shake these bags. They're actually bag houses, big bag houses. So if it is from outside so that it doesn't collapse, they have to have a, like a support shell in, uh, from the inside. There are different ways of dealing with it. People are even interested in the computational fluid dynamics around it to look to see what are the flow velocities and temperatures, et cetera, et cetera, so that you can have an efficient bag house. This is like a typical bag house. Many, many socks hanging over there in a box, in a shell. This is what it looks like in real. Ah, this is typical, the size of an air pollution control device in an industry. Look at the size. I think students need to get a sense of it. If you can take them for an industrial visit, it'll be fabulous. Because I took, you know, my students, we do it as a part of a course always. We took them to Tata Power Plant, and they actually got a sense of how big the electrostatic precipitator, the size of this hall. 
I mean, a good 30 to 40 percent of the in capital investment actually goes into uh, electrostatic precipitators. They're very high-end equipment. Okay. Okay. This is now where I want to talk about fibrous material. Fibrous material is not sieving. Okay. Everybody understand this? My handkerchief, a lovely handkerchief, right? Everybody, handkerchief, handkerchief, handkerchief. Yes. Okay. Typically, what I'll do is I'll do this and tie it up, right? If I'm going to a gurudwara, I do it the other way around, right? Okay. Good. So. Like that, you would do. Now, does it help? There's air coming from here, air coming from here. It doesn't help very much. I went to IPL. At some point in time, there was in Nagothane. There was, they were having a course, so we were talking about it. And I said, guys, you deal with powder a lot. So I told these guys, I said, you deal with a lot of particulate matter, right? He says, ha. So I said, what do you do? How do you protect it? Nahin, nahin, sir, there's a mask. I said, okay, mask, take it, how do you do it, how do you use it? So he says, you know, sir, actually, no, it's not very good. But what we do is, we make it wet. And after making it wet, it is very effective. I said, really? He says, yeah. I said, okay, bring me two next time. So he brought two next time. And we actually took one, and I, the dry one, and we put it against the light. And we couldn't see much of the light through it. You understand, right? If you take a handkerchief, right? And I look, look at light like that through it, I'll see a little bit of light, diffused light kind of a thing. The moment we wet that mask and then looked at it, it the light could be seen clearly. So which one was more effective? The dry one, dry one, okay? Now, the, the understanding is where the issue is. You are not, when the particle is going through this fiber, through this fabric, okay, it is not going as a sieve. It is actually following, getting into an Amazon jungle, where there are these, lot of these fibers, fibrous material around it, etc. It has to go this way, it has to go that way. At some point in time, it will diffuse to a surface or get attached to a surface. It is not going through like it's a, okay, let's go walk through the, no, it's not like that, right? So the moment I wet it, the moment I wet it, a lot of these threads which have the fibrous material all over the place, okay? So everybody understand that the moment it particular thread, in that particular thread, when these fibrous material, because it's wet, because it's wet, they tend to, tend to get stick, they tend to stick to the main body of the thread. So there's that Amazon jungle has suddenly become like a clear chai ka mesh. Okay, now, I, I want to qualify that. If the pollutant out there is gaseous, and if it has affinity for water, which means that it is soluble in water, it's a good idea to have a wet handkerchief or have a wet mask. Everybody with me? Please don't mix up the two things, okay? Ants, different from elephants. If Ammonia molecule is there and it has affinity for water, by all means, wet your handkerchief. But if you are using it for dust, not a good idea because the wet lint will tend to collapse on the main thread and it will clear passages, so it takes away the tortuosity of the particular mechanism. So the mechanism of mechanical filtration is the tortuous path that a particle has to go through the Amazon jungle. Everybody with me? Okay, very good. We're coming to a close very soon. All right, so that's just a repeat. Electrical, again, you use, charge a particle, and you put it in an electrical field. Okay, you use that. And these are huge, again, the size of this room I said. That's the principle for it. This is the size. Gases absorption, which is, I just said, ammonia, for example, has affinity for water. So during monsoons, during monsoons, the water, which is falling from the sky, the rain, actually does a good job in scrubbing the gases. It actually takes away the pollutants, both the particulate matter as well as the gaseous matter. Okay. Adsorption, activated carbon, everybody knows. Yeah, okay. A lot of times activated carbon in you is used in these cartridges also because it tends to absorb the hydrocarbons. It has an affinity for hydrocarbons. It's a surface phenomena. It's not a dissolution, it's not a solubility phenomena, it's a surface phenomena. Incineration. A lot of times at night, if you're going in a train somewhere, you see, oh, there, like you can see a flame over there, and you know there is some industry over there. And why are they wasting this gas? They could easily have gone, you know, taken it and used it somewhere. No, they can't. Thermodynamically and from a process perspective, they cannot use it beyond a certain point. So they have to, so instead of letting it out as hydrocarbons, they're doing a responsible thing by burning it. And if you burn it nicely, it'll get converted to carbon dioxide and water. Otherwise, as a hydrocarbon, it can cause more damage, okay? So you can use, so this is absorption, the, the, the absorption towers could look that tall, okay? Students need to get a sense of the scale. 
They really need to get a sense of the scale. This is the kind of scale, okay? In a barge, <laughs> it's huge. It's a part, a very small part of a larger, more complicated process. So the challenge is to be able to interface it in a way in which they work well together. Okay, this is adsorption. By the way, there are these local, I think I've seen more applications of adsorption in water. Haven't you, have you come across? They use it as a polishing step also in the, in the, as the last step in, uh, before they put it in the distribution system. Okay, incineration. See the flares at night? Okay, now this one is pretty good, okay? This one is pretty good. You can hardly see the flame, which is good. If it's invisible flame, very good. That means oxidation is very nice. But this friend over here, this one, not good. It's not enough air being supplied for complete oxidation, okay? All right, this is what a typical top of a burner looks like. It can be multi-port. From different parts of the process industry, it could have one inlet coming in which gets burned. So they have one common point where all of it is getting burnt. Okay, so it could be look, look like this. Okay, this is on a typical oil rig where they are trying to deal with bringing a new well into activity. So they have to get rid of the oil which is mixed with mud. Never a clean operation. They can't have a clean operation because a large part of it is mud. So, but you know, they need to res uh, responsibly dispose of this particular oil and gas. Okay, I'm gonna take just a couple of minutes and complete. At this point in time, all the information that I could have given to you is given to students, okay? Everything given. Now is the time when they'll actually have to deal with playing a role. And the role we said is that of a collector, all right? So we say, okay, there's a science over here, which we understand, but then the question is, it's not gonna come into play till you have a certain accountability around it, all right? So let's say, home, you're the collector of the city, you are the, please say, you are the, everybody say. See it again. Because some people are, you know, don't see all colors. Okay, get the point? Okay, next. You. 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 Okay, got it? Any one more you? No, that's it, okay. <laughs> so, you know, you just wanna do a little bit of fun so that students can actually get the sense of that. Listen, this is, I'm being addressed as a collector and this is my accountability now. So you have to you know, kind of bring that game, a little bit of play. You have to be playful, okay? You know this by now. If you haven't got it by now, I'm taking the next one and a half hour session also. No, 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 you want Harish. Where's Harish? Is he around? Okay. All right. So as a collector, you first collect historical data. So for Chandrapur, this is the historical data for the last 10 years. Okay, based on this, you'll have some sense of what, how's the air quality doing. If it is already good, have a good time, do other things as a collector. But if the air quality is bad, then you need to take steps to be able to deal with it. So then we'll have to look at location of the sources. There are point sources, line sources, area sources. You need to get a sense of where are the sources in your geographic area. So these are the mines over here, this is the industry over here, et cetera, et cetera. You get a sense of where it is, okay? Predominant wind direction. Then you develop an inventory. How much sulfur dioxide? From where? How much oxides of nitrogen? From where? How much carbon monoxide? From where? How much PM? From where? Using emission factors. For every activity, you have a sense of how much is being emitted by a particular activity. So for every megawatt of coal-based power plant production of energy, of electricity, how much carbon monoxide is allowed? Okay, so you'll get some sense of that using it. And then this is typically being done at a 500 meter by 500 meter resolution. Especially in six, you know, six large cities, we had done this. You understand, half a kilometer by far, half a kilometer, you know exactly which source in that half a kilometer by half a kilometer and how much it is emitting. Pretty good, right, as a collector? You are the boss. Collectors, everybody? Hello, collectors. Good. We acquire the meteorological data. What is the meteorological data? Wind speed, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you get that. Then you use a dispersion model to estimate the pollution isoplets. So you could do it on a daily basis, you can do it on a seasonal basis, you can do it on an annual basis. You won't do it, but you will hire some engineers who are trained in air quality to do this for you. But as a collector, you want to know, want to be sure that this gets done. Otherwise, you can't make a decision. Business as usual versus benefits from it. So if you were to take an intervention, see, as a person who's a decision maker, I would say, listen, if I shut down this industry, will it make a difference? You just have to go to the model and it'll be able to tell you how much of a difference it'll make. Because, for example, in Chandrapur, they shut down the industry. It still didn't make a difference with the air quality. Then why shut down the industry? Fair enough? Okay, good. Um, which sources affecting larger population, etc.? So those questions. Okay, so if you've identified the culprits, 
Okay? Then you can shut down the industry and ask people to stop cooking. Why stop cooking? Because a large part of the Chandrapur problem is coming from coal cook stoves, which 50,000 people are using in the morning, 50,000 people are using in the evening, and that's the, that's the only way, they, there's, there's a certain level of poverty. They can't afford anything else. They use this. This is available for them, and they use it. Right? So you can't do that. So simply said, whatever I said, as a large plan, collector's plan, correct? Simply said, it's going to lead to unemployment. It's going to ask people to start grazing. You know, I mean, you, oh, next elections will be lost. There are implications. You and I are pretty aware of it. It's just that you and I probably don't have the wherewithal or, you know, we don't have, you know, the, uh, the training or the thinking to be able to. But these are the implications which a collector will have to deal with, right? Okay, so let's just review. I'm just saying historical data. Can you get this data right away? Will they give it to you? They'll not give it to you. It'll take six months to get this data. Oh, by that time, the collector will get transferred. Okay, okay, then, you know, location of the sources. There are places where people won't let you come into the 500 meter by 500 meter because they don't want you to know what they're doing there. Some of the recycle, reuse industry for lead batteries, for example. Lot of lead. Lot of lead being thrown out from there, but you, they won't let you go in there. Ulhas River, especially in water, Ulhas River, uh, Walduni, there are places where some dying is happening, some genes dying, okay? It's very highly polluting in industry, water industry. They won't let you in. There's, there's a huge mafia in place which will not let you even go in. Students also can't go in. Okay, so it's not that straightforward to say, let me find the location of the sources. Whatever is reported, whatever is in the organized sector, I can deal with probably, probably, probably. However, which is not in the organized sector, is very difficult. So, you know, this one, yeah, there are always, what numbers do you get? Do you, know, do you know the exact number of cars? Probably from the RTO office you can get it. But, you know, there's always a lag between what's going on and what's actually the case. So, uh, 500, 500 meter is a, is a very ambitious uh, resolution, okay? But we did it as a part of six city study. There's a lot of investment that's required for, a, for an exercise like that. So you, as a collector of Chandrapur, may not have that kind of a um, resource available to you. Meteorological data. Oh, let's just quickly look at this. So, but you know, there are these three IMD stations. And when I compare the wind roses, they look pretty good. Wind roses similar, these two places similar, these two places similar. So three places, one, two, three, on a, almost a 200 kilometer triangle are pretty similar. But it, when it comes down to all three being similar, when it comes down to Chandrapur, for some reason, that particular wind rose is very different. Okay, so you and I therefore become responsible to make sure that the data that is going into the model is accurate. Because this over here clearly is going to define the entire future of development in Chandrapur. And clearly, in this particular case, this data being used is wrong. So we go looking, doing some work, and it's not their fault. They, they do the best that they can. It's just that sometimes, you know, they, they don't realize what's going on. So we actually have done some work to uh, look to see that there are two other stations over here, and we're comparing to see whether, see, if one here, one here, one here, 200 kilometers apart, they are similar on an annual basis. I don't see what's so peculiar about this particular one that has to be different. It's right in the middle of a triangle. Wind suddenly can't say, oh, Chandrapur, let me go this way. They don't do that, right? So we compared with some of the other uh, stations over there. These look similar, but you know that particular place, which is being used for all the modeling work in Chandrapur, is different. So we are inquiring into what's the correction to be made over there. Okay. So holistic viewpoint we need to take, and you know um, we need to just do the diagnostics to see uh, if, if this is what the industry is claiming that they're polluting, and say even if they're lying. Even if they're bad people, they're giving you all lies. They're under under reporting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's say even if I double it. Even if I double the emissions that are coming from there, they're not reporting, et cetera, uh, still I cannot account for a good 40 to 60%. So Chandrapur, which was the fourth most polluted city, 500 crores, 400, 500 crores spent on it, it went from fourth most polluted to the second most polluted. What happened? Was the money, you know, did it go in the bad places? No, it actually got used. But they were not working on the issues that were actually causing the problem. So we need to actually look at what is really causing the problem. And they also found if the, sh if the industry shut down, that it didn't affect the pollution levels at all. It was affecting, but 40 kilometers away, 30 kilometers away, because the chimneys are tall. OK? All right. Uh, some other things that you could do. Recent efforts, we're using satellite data to be able to compare. Satellite data is really great fun. Okay, At some point in time, we should probably just have a workshop on satellite data. Okay, It should be fun. Episodic event, you actually use an episodic event where you say, okay, this is the time when the plant was shut down for three months. 
April, May, June, three months it was shut down. So we compared with the previous year and the following year for the same month. Clearly, there was a contribution coming from the power plant. But interestingly, again, locally, what you and I were breathing in Chandrapur, it didn't affect. At a regional level, it affected. But at a local level, it didn't affect, okay? because there are more chulas and dust over there which are affecting it rather than these industries. Okay, you know, do a little bit of work on this solar, but this pretty much gets covered in the movies. An inconvenient truth pretty much covers this whole in concept of uh, the uh, global warming, et cetera. Okay. Then, you know, not all gases are equal. So you actually can compare different planets, et cetera. And this is CO2 levels, global warming potential, carbon, mono, carbon dioxide versus methane. We can get to the details of that. Energy. What I like, the last thing I want to leave you with is, uh, human beings are 100 watt machines. Okay. So uh, there was a label which said 100 watt machine. So human beings are 100 watt machines. So I also gave an exercise to the students to look to see if you were a 100 watt machine, what would it take to sustain you, just from a perspective of overall energy consumption, et cetera, et cetera. How every time you get a milkshake, people love milkshakes. There's a time I used to love milkshakes. When, you are, when your milkshake is being made for those 15, 20 seconds, mm, 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 you know how many servants are working for you? Typically, there's 1,200 watts machine, 1,200 watts. So there are 12 servants working for you. You are the emperor or the empress at that point in time because there are 12 people over there waiting, making milkshake for you. You get the point? It's a little, you know, so students actually enjoy doing that exercise of saying, okay, you know, how, how many cars? If you go in a car, if you go in a scooter, right? How many people are actually carrying your little pal, you know, chariot or your little palki? So those kinds of things you can do. Okay, um, so there's so, uh, some of the other activities, and this is the last slide, I think. Uh, Bhopal Gas Leak, there's a film. I'll give you the link for it. There's another short film, Smog Incorporated. There's a video, Ram, Jairam Ramesh had come for a uh, talk over here with students. So it's got a, that time he was a minister of environment and forest. It's a lovely video, you know. I think you should share it with the students. Uh, then in, based on that, I give question to the uh, homework also. So notice my homeworks are all around videos and all stuff, right? So people have actually, and says, what are the key issues of environmental protection governance for India that Sri Jairam Ramesh highlighted in his entire session? And there, what is the call to the youth of the country therein? Because the point is that he was actually talking to the young students at IIT at that time. This was in 2010. All right, happy seasons. <laughs> Depending on the season, I also introduce a couple of slides. So if it's just before Holi, I wish them happy Holi, and then tell them, look out for the particulate matter in the air, <laughs> right? And if it is, <laughs> and same thing for Diwali, so then they, you know, this conscious. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, time for lunch. I'm available. If you have any questions, please, uh, I'll be, you know, here to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Have a great lunch. See you soon. <laughs>